Aloha. Great to see you all. Welcome to Women in the Word. Um, we have a good study tonight on forgiveness, something that's kind of hard to do, but the Lord wants us to learn this because it's just so important for our health and our peace of mind. So let me open our time in prayer, and then you can share your prayer requests, pray for one another, and go through the lesson. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for these precious sisters in Christ who are here because they want to study your word. They want to know you better through your word. I pray you'll just bless them. Speak to everybody tonight. Speak to our hearts. For those who are especially struggling with forgiving someone, I pray that you'll just minister to them tonight in a special way and help them. And thank you that we get to be together. Thank you most of all that you're here with us. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I've been watching with interest the reports about Lahaina's famous banyan tree um, that somehow survived the terrible fire in Maui nine months ago. That iconic banyan tree was planted more than 150 years ago on April 24, 1873. Um, it was planted to mark the 50th anniversary of the first American Protestant mission to the island. And when they put it in the ground, it was just a single trunk, eight feet tall. Um, but over the years, it grew and grew until, until it nearly covered a whole block with some of its branches being 100 feet long. But of course, that was before the fire. I brought some before and after photos. You might have seen some of these on the news or online. But that famous banyan tree reminds me a little bit of David's life. As I said last week, he was running for his life for seven to 10 years. Um, King Saul was after him, intent on killing him. So David lived constantly under the threat of death, yet he survived. He survived because God was with him, watching over him. Uh, we read this past week in 1 chap Samuel chapters 24 and 26, two episodes that took place in the desert near the, Red, the Dead Sea, where David had perfect opportunities to strike Saul down, yet he refused to do it. He refused to vindicate himself and take the king's life. David chose to extend grace and forgiveness to the person who was trying to kill him. And in this way, David's heart was very much like God's heart. He's a great role model for us. Several hundred misfits and outcasts and rebels somehow found David in the desert and joined him there, and David began to train them, both spiritually and militarily. The Lord had given David a little respite, a little time to train his men while King Saul and the army of Israel were busy pursuing the Philistines. But then Saul turned his sights back on David, and 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 2 say, after Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. Um, the desert of En Gedi is near the Dead Sea, and it's a really desolate wilderness land where temperatures can soar to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, here are some photos of the desert. Yeah, it's really bleak. Can you imagine living there in the wilderness like that for seven to 10 years? Verses three through four say, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. So as Saul was relieving himself, he had no idea that David and his men were, were further back in the same cave. It was a perfect opportunity for David to strike. And that's exactly what his men urged him to do. They even said in verse 4, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. David's men jumped to the conclusion that because Saul was right there in the same cave, that meant that God wanted David to kill him. Um, they said, here's, here's a sword, David, go get him. But David didn't listen to his men. And here's a little warning for us. We need to be careful that we don't do what David's men did. They supported an idea of their own by claiming, this is from God. 
um, the Lord ends up getting blamed for a lot of things that he has nothing to do with. Before we say something is of God, we need to check our hearts and make absolutely sure that it is from God and not just something that we want. David was more in tune with God than his men were. So no matter how evil Saul was, David knew that he wasn't Saul's judge. God had made Saul king, and it was God's business, not his, to remove Saul when the time was right. So the end of verse 4 lets us know that David just silently crept up behind Saul and cut off a little corner of his robe. But then, instead of gloating over what he'd done, David became troubled. Verse 5 says, Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He felt convicted. Even that small action felt disrespectful, and it bothered his conscience. And that's how it is with a person who's walking closely with the Lord. David didn't want to sin even a little bit. David was back in a close relationship with God. So even that little gesture, like cutting off the corner of Saul's robe, bothered his conscience. And rather than justify it, he really regretted it. By the way, in those days, the border of a garment was significant. Uh, In Numbers 15, God had commanded Moses to tell the people of Israel to make the border of their garments blue. Why blue? Because blue is the color of heaven. So when the people saw the hems of their garments, they would be reminded that they were a heavenly people and they were not to be enamored with the world. In Bible days, uh, people could get an idea of other people's status and wealth and by the size of the border of their garments because the blue dye that they used was obtained from a certain kind of sea snail, and extracting the dye was a really costly and lengthy process. So Saul was likely wearing a robe with a wide blue hem, and David felt convicted even for cutting off just the corner of his robe. He told his men in verse 6, Far be it from me that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, since he is the Lord's anointed. My dad was an officer in the Air Force, and we often lived right on base. So when I was a child, I got used to seeing airmen, you know, saluting my dad every day. For example, when we'd drive off the base, and I would see my dad, you know, salute other officers who were higher ranking than him. They didn't have to know each other personally. They just had to see the insignia on the other person's um, uniform, and then the officer of lower rank would salute the officer of higher rank. Um, and wait for that person to salute them back before they would walk on or drive on. In the military, you don't salute the particular man or woman. You salute the rank. So a captain will salute a major, even if the major's a jerk and he doesn't like him, but because he's saluting the rank, not the person. David understood that. Saul was the king, and God had anointed him king. So no matter how unfair Saul was or even how insane he'd become, uh, it was up to God to either keep him in power or remove him as he saw fit. And it was up to David to respect Saul's rank and his position as the king. So after cutting off the corner of Saul's robe, David was convicted. He realized he'd been operating in the flesh, and he told his men so. Verse 7 says, And David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave, and went on his way. There's something about a person who walks with God. Their godly lifestyle can be kind of infectious. People don't want to sit in front of a person like that. And often they want to be like them. So David's ragtag bunch of men followed his lead. And verse 8 says, Saul left the cave, and David stepped out and called after him, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked back, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. He not only alerted King Saul of his presence, but he showed him tremendous respect. And then they had this unusual conversation. David said in verse 9, Why do you listen to the words of men who say David seeks to harm you? And then he waved that little piece of cloth so the king could see it. And he said in verse 10, This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you. 
but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See my father, he continued, verse 11. Look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but I did not kill you. See that there's nothing in my hand to indicate that I'm um, guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. David just very respectfully stated the truth. And then he said in verses 12 through 15, May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge me on you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the old saying goes, From evil doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Who are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. That was a wake-up call for King Saul, and he had a moment of clear thinking. In verse 16, he said, when David finished saying this, Saul asked, is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. Then in verses 17 through 19, he called out, is that really you, my son, David? David was his son-in-law. And then he began to cry, and he said to David, You are a better man than I, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today, for when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness that you've shown to me today. And then Saul continued, verses 20 through 21, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So verse 22 says, David gave his oath to Saul and then Saul returned home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. Notice it doesn't say David returned home. He was wise not to trust King Saul. Saul may have been sincere at the time. He may have had good intentions right then. The problem is the flesh. Lots of people make promises to reform, but though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So the issue isn't reformation. The issue is regeneration. We've got to be born again. Then with God's spirit inside us, we're more likely to succeed in changing. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. So no matter how good the counselor is or the 12-step program is, and no matter how sincere people might be, the flesh ultimately wells up again. Um, Saul may have been sincere, but he lacked the ability to keep his word because God's spirit wasn't in him. He was no longer walking with the Lord, and he wasn't drawing strength from the Lord. Thus, even if he was sincere, he really wasn't able to control his flesh. In any case, David did have a season of peace, and, you know, after Saul repented and gave his word in verse 22. God knows how to make your enemies be at peace with you when you're truly trying to please the Lord. Uh, in the long run, peace came for David when Saul was eventually killed in battle. But after this confrontation, David experienced at least a season of peace to just rest and regroup. Chuck Swindoll sums up some of the lessons that we can take out of this chapter. He says, first, since man is depraved, expect to be mistreated. Someday when Jesus comes back or when we're united with him in heaven, things will be different. There will be no sin or evil, no sorrow there. But we're not home yet. And as long as we're in this world, we're gonna, there are going to be evil people under Satan, Satan's influence who are going to mistreat us. So don't be shocked if you're mistreated. Expect it. Second, since mistreatment is inevitable, anticipate feelings of revenge. Don't retaliate, but just know that those feelings of wanting revenge will come because they certainly will. Um, as we mature in Christ, we realize that we cannot afford to allow our feelings to dictate our actions because many times our feelings will go against what God wants us to do. So we need to choose to do what's right and what's pleasing to the Lord despite of how we feel. 
Jesus said in John 5.30, I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Jesus didn't live by his feelings, and neither should we. We need to live as God directs us, not as our feelings direct us. And third, since the desire for revenge is predictable, refuse to fight in the flesh. Jesus did not say, do unto others as they do unto you. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, plan in advance that you're, you won't retaliate, that you will treat others the way you wish they would treat you. If the other person has a perpetual problem with rage, it's okay to put some distance between you and them, just like David wisely put distance between himself and Saul. You don't have to stay there and invite explosion after explosion. Um, if you're looking for a chance to pay back someone who's hurting you, that's a sure sign that you're still in emotional bondage to them um, and to their sin. So how do you get out of emotional bondage? By forgiving the person who hurt you. Forgiving someone isn't admitting that um, what they did was okay. Not at all. David didn't think it was okay that Saul was trying to kill him. He asked him, why are you trying to kill me? Even though what the other person has done or is still doing is terribly wrong, and even if they haven't apologized, forgiveness is still the right choice. Forgiving is simply placing the offense and the person who hurt you in the hands of God, the only righteous judge, and then letting go of it and trusting God to deal with them and vindicate you. As Yvella mentioned a few weeks ago, Pastor Wayne often says, refusing to forgive someone is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It just doesn't work that way. You're the one who rises in emotional pain and dies little by little because of all the bitterness eating you up from the inside. Forgiveness is for you. Um, it's even more of a blessing to you than it is to the person who offended you. Colossians 3.13, which we read in our homework, says, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. How did the Lord forgive you? Completely and absolutely, right? And after he forgives you, he chooses not to even remember your sins against you anymore. He, see, he sees you as if you had never committed those sins. Corey Ten Boom used to say, he's buried your sins in the depths of the sea, and then he posted a sign on the shore that says, no fishing. I like that. So that's the way we're to forgive others. God's will on the matter is clear, but nobody said it's easy <laughs> to forgive. It's not. So a good place is to just start by praying, praying, Lord, help me be willing to forgive. And then you make the conscious choice to forgive, whether you feel like it or not. You might have to grit your teeth and pray, Lord, you know how hard this is for me, but I choose to forgive because you've told me to. So help me truly, completely forgive the person who's hurt me. This isn't about how you feel. Forgiving a person who's hurt you is a choice to obey God regardless of how you feel. After that, each time you're reminded of that person or that offense and the anger and the pain, you know, rises up in your heart again, you reiterate the decision that you've already made to forgive and ask God to help you. You might have to pray 10 or 20 or 100 times, Lord, I've already chosen to forgive that person, but please let your forgiveness flow through me and help me to totally let go of that offense. One of the most helpful passages that I've come across regarding forgiveness is Romans 12, verses 14 through 21, which was in our homework, and especially verses 18 through 21, which read, if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
How often are we supposed to take revenge according to that passage? Never, <laughs> right? Not sometimes or occasionally, not even once, <laughs> never. But look at God's promise. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So put the offense and the offender in God's hands, and he will deal with them. That's his promise. You might not see or understand all the way, ways that he is dealing with them, but you can trust the Lord. He said he will, he will avenge you. You can trust him. You can't change another person anyway. The only person you can change is you. So just work on yourself on getting rid of the bitterness and get that poison out of your system by forgiving everyone who's hurt and offended you and then let God deal with them. He promises he will. David is a great role model. And we don't just see it in chapter 24, but in chapter 26 as well. And by the way, um, we're not skipping chapter 25. We're going to study that next week. But in chapter 26, Saul... Um, has let his paranoia get the best of him, and he's after David again. So in 1 Samuel 26, verses 1 through 4 say, the Ziphites let King Saul know that David was hiding in the hill of Hachilah, which is before Jeshimon. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 select Israelite troops to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakila, facing Jeshimon, but David stayed in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. I brought some in images of the desert of Ziph too. Um, it is so desolate. What a place to have to live and hide out, right? Um, David spent years in places like this, hiding out from King Saul. Verses 5 through 7 say, Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army and camped around him. David then asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Abishai, son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. And verses 8 through 11 say, Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him or his time will come and he will die or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So again, David refused to kill the king when he had an opportunity. He just re and he refused to let Abishai kill him. Verses 12 says, So David took the spear and the water jug near Saul's head, and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them, and he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner. Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you that calls out to the king? And David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord, the king? Someone came to destroy your lord, the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men must die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. So David was implying that he cared more for Saul's life than Abner did. Then he says in verse 16, look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Verse 17 says, Saul recognized David's voice and he said, is that your voice, David, my son? And David replied in verse 18, yes, it is, my lord, the king. Proverbs 28, 1 says, the righteous are as bold as a lion. 
And I want to point out just how brave David was now. He was so bold. What a contrast to the way he was acting in last week's lesson, right? Um, not only did David sneak into Saul's camp, but he challenged Abner's authority. Uh, this reminds me of Paul before King Agrippa, or some of the reformers like Martin Luther before the Diet of Worms, or John Knox before Queen Mary. Someone said, I will not tremble in the presence of men if I have trembled in the presence of God. Spending time alone with the Lord gives us boldness and peace and confidence, which David certainly had now. So he asked Saul in verse 18, why is my Lord pursuing his servant? What have I done and what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my Lord the king listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. In other words, he's saying, if the Lord has stirred your heart to punish me because I've been wrong, if I'm out of line, then I need to bring an offering of sacrifice to the Lord. David invited the king to point out his wrongdoing. He, he wanted his heart to be right with the Lord. And verse 19 continues, if, however, people have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. So he's saying, if people have lied to you about me and they're causing you to feel animosity toward me, let them be cursed. He, he's making it easy here for King Saul to repent. Um, he knew that neither the Lord nor other people had stirred up Saul against him. His animosity toward gave, David came from his own envy and jealousy and his own bitterness. But David offers these suggestions to give Saul an easy way to repent. He was giving Saul an opportunity to admit that his actions against David were wrong without having to admit that they'd originated within himself. David goes on in verse 19, They have driven me today from my share of the Lord's inheritance and have said, Go serve other gods. The thing that concerned David most was that he had been prevented access to worshiping God with his people. Verse 20, now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountain. So David, you know, sums up his plea, please don't kill me out here in the wilderness far away from the presence of the Lord. Then Saul said in verse 21, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have been terribly wrong. Well, we know from Scripture that Saul was in his early 70s at this time. How sad to be 70 years old and look back on your life and say, I've been a fool. I've pursued the things that I shouldn't have pursued. Verse 22 says, David answered, Here's the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards everyone for their righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all my trouble. And then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, David, my son. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. Once again, David had had the chance to kill King Saul, but he refused. And Saul didn't dominate his thoughts anymore. The Lord did. In last week's lesson, David was full of fear. And that caused him to lie and make the dumb mistake of trying to hide out with the enemy. God rescued him, but now it seems like he'd gotten over his frantic fear of Saul, and it was God who saturated his thoughts again. So no wonder he was able to forgive like God forgives over and over again. Some people seem graced with the ability to forgive a lot more easily than others do. And may I say, forgiveness does get easier with practice. Um, it's something that you grow in. <laughs> We can all forgive one-time small offenders, you know, the guy who takes the parking place that you were waiting for or the lady who rudely cut in front of you in the line. We don't like those things, but, you know, we're miffed for a few minutes and then we get over it. But it's harder with the Sauls in our lives, those who give us grief continually or, you know, who, who seem to be just out to get us. It's harder to forgive them but it's even more important that we do. 
Max Lucado says, vengeance fixes your attention on life's ugliest moments. Score settling freezes your stare at cruel events in your past. Is this where you want to look? Will rehearsing and reliving your hurts make you a better person? By no means. It will destroy you. I read a story about a guy who was super irritated because a fellow he knew would always poke his finger in his chest when he'd talk to him. So he vowed to get even. He decided to tie a little bottle of nitroglycerin to a string and hang it under his shirt at the exact spot where the guy always poked it. He told his buddy, the next time that guy sticks his finger in my chest, he's going to pay for it. Unfortunately, the person seeking revenge pays even more. David demonstrated a different way to think and act. Despite the fact that Saul was out to get him and tried to kill him over and over again, David chose to forgive him rather than retaliate. He chose to focus on God's love for him and God's power and God's might rather than on Saul's awful behavior toward him. David could see that Saul's sanity was slipping away, so he stayed away from him. But he still respected his rank and position as king, and he respected God even more. God had placed Saul in power, and it was God's job, um, not David's, to remove him. David's job was to focus on the Lord and get to know the Lord more and more so his love and forgiveness would flow naturally and freely through David, even to his enemies. Max Lucado tells a story of how a Rottweiler attacked his golden retriever puppy in a kennel some years ago and nearly killed the puppy. It was just horrible. There were, you know, terrible bites and gashes all over his little puppy, and one ear was practically torn off. Max was really upset, so he wrote a letter to the Rottweiler's owner urging him to put the dog to sleep. But when the kennel owner saw the letter, she begged Max to reconsider. She said, what that Rottweiler did was horrible, but I'm still training him. I'm not finished with him yet. And I think that's what God would say about the person who attacks you. What he or she did was horrible, but God isn't finished with your enemy yet. Your enemies still figure into God's plan. If they're still alive, that means God hasn't given up on them yet. They may be out of God's will, but they are not out of his reach. So our job when we see or think about those people who have hurt us is to choose to forgive them and to see them as God's projects and his responsibility. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for David's example in tonight's chapters. As David forgave Saul and just refused to take vengeance, help each of us to forgive those who hurt us and trust you to deal with them. Help us forgive fully and freely like you do. Bless my sisters, Lord. Keep up the good work you're doing in all of our lives to make us more and more like you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a good week.